pleased to welcome you to another program where we're talking about revivals. And today we're going across into Asia and we're going to the land of Korea. I don't know what comes to your mind when we talk about Korea. If you're familiar with the South, then you may think of uh, a wonderful country that it is and uh, marvelous things that are happening there. If you think of the North, well, all sorts of ideas come to mind when we think of the North Korea and the people who live there. But over a hundred years ago, just over, a mighty revival took place. And in the capital, Pyongyang, well, it was called the Jerusalem uh, of the area. Such was the uh, excitement that there was of the Christian things that were happening there. Today, we're going to be looking at that revival. And I'm pleased to say that with me here for the program is Matthew Bacola, who has written on many other revivals, including Korea. That's right, yes, Pyong. Great Revival, what a title that, that was given it to it, The Great Revival. And like you said, it was the Jerusalem of the East. It was an incredible time. And it was an infant church, a very young church it was indeed. But God really came and touched the people and touched that church. Well, I think that's the thing that, that strikes me, that they, they didn't get the Gospel, they didn't get the, the New Testament until about 1900, and they didn't get the Old Testament until about 1911. So it's, it's a very young church compared with many other countries around the world. That's right. You had uh, Robert Germain Thomas, uh, a, a Welshman, and he was the first Protestant missionary to Korea. And he basically went there and taken in Bibles in the Chinese script, which the Koreans could read. And he, went, he risked decapitation if caught. And um, eventually he was caught and he was decapitated. And there's a lovely story told that in the 1907 revival that we're talking about, one of those who went forward and made a confession of faith in Christ actually stood up and publicly said, I was the one who executed uh, Thomas and uh, was, was his murderer. That's right. I mean, what a confession to make to say that I was the one who killed that man who tried to bring us the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. In many respects, it could be said it was like the like Saul when he was converted. You know, he was there consenting to the death of Stephen, the first uh, Christian martyr. But then God had mercy upon him, and Paul went on to do wonderful, great and mighty exploits for the Lord. But what is interesting, the actual executioner, like, who like I say got converted, as Robert Germain Thomas was fleeing ashore, he was handing out these Bibles as, as quickly as he could, because he knew that once he got caught and captured, that would be it for him. But anyway, the executioner took one of those Bibles himself, and he used the leaves, as the leaves of the Bible, as decorative wallpaper. And he literally plastered them around his house. So, you know, this man got the Bible, he got the Word of God. Surrounded. Yes, it's incredible. Well, it is an incredible story of what happened in Korea. And, and what I have to say as I listen to that story is, do it again, Lord, do it again. And God will do it and breakthrough will come in Korea. But we very much need to be thinking, there is a church in North Korea and it's a vibrant church, but nothing like a church that you or I would know. Open Doors are one of the organisations who are involved in working in Northern Korea, and they've just put this little statistics together of what it is like to be a Christian in North Korea today. As you watch it, I just want to encourage you, pray for North Korea. <laughs> 
talked about how Robert Thomas was the first known martyr uh, in Korea, and you can't help thinking as you look at what the church is experiencing today in this underground situation in North Korea, there are many more martyrs who are sowing their seeds, sowing their blood, in order to bring the church back into uh, fruition in uh, North Korea. It's a tragic story. Uh, Open Doors produce every year a, a, a list of the most persecuted churches in the world and North Korea constantly come out at number one. More than a decade now they've been number one. I mean it's interesting the scriptures tells us that you know, we should pray for the, our brethren, you know, persecuted brethren, as if we were ourselves chained with them. And you know, they are suffering terribly and we should be praying that God would give them grace and strength so they can endure their suffering and so that God can really help them. Well, we said Robert Thomas was the first known uh, missionary. He came from China where he'd been working with Hudson Taylor in the China Inland Mission. Um, that was 1866. The first known convert to be baptized, I think, was 1886. The New Testament was 1900. The Old Testament was 1911. It's a very young church, and it's a church which really all its life has experienced persecution because the, the Japanese came, didn't they, into well, Korea? Well, that's right, yeah. The Koreans were always... Uh, between a rock and a hard place with China and Japan. I mean, in 1910, the Japanese came and basically took over Korea, which was a very you know difficult time. You know, uh, imagine a people group co you know, coming into your land and taking it over. Um, but by then, you know, the revival had begun, and there were reports that Japanese soldiers themselves were converted in the revival because you talk about the revival, which began in 1907, and you know it went past 1910 and. Um, but Japanese soldiers themselves, so like the persecutors, the oppressors, perhaps it's a bit like um, Cornelius, the Roman centurion, perhaps it's a bit like him. You know, they were, the Romans were an occupying force in Israel at the time, but God still had mercy upon them. Well, we talked about how the first missionary was a Welshman. The missionaries who came to Korea primarily came around the late 1800s and early 1900s. They were from America, Canada and Britain, weren't they? That is correct, yes. Um, I mean, these missionaries themselves have been really touched by God. Some of them have actually been touched in revivals in their own lands. Just think about the 1857 revival. Some of them had been involved in that, or their parents had they been touched. And so it was passed on to them about revival. And they wanted to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And I think 1885 is a significant year for the church in Korea when different groups of missionaries came. But I think those missionaries came and, and they longed for revival and they thought it was going to come through witnessing, through yeah. preaching and the like. It came in an unusual way, but it came through the missionaries. A Christian conference, this is like January uh, 1907, and it was a public meeting. And in this public meeting, which was a Christian conference, God really came in. Basically, one of the, the missionaries' helpers, a co-worker in the Lord, basically stood up and he confessed his sin, the sin that he actually had hated or despised the missionary man. And that brought about a great reconciliation and great repentance. Now the missionary himself also stood up and said, I have to confess my sin, I've looked down upon you. And it tells us in the Bible that where there's unity, you think about Psalm 133, there God commands the blessing. Mm. And so there was this reconciliation and the blessing of God came. Right, and that was Blair, I think the missionary was called, if I remember right. But, but I, I want us to just go back a little before that, because 1903, 1904, the missionaries were there, and, and they were struggling to make any impact and weren't making any impact. And in 1904, the missionaries came together to, to have a devotional and a conference. And they asked one of their number, and he was a man called Hardy, in order to prepare the devotionals. And as Hardy prepared, God began to speak in his own heart. And sometimes it can be very humbling when God speaks in your own heart and he's asking you to do things which you don't, you don't really want to do. Let's just listen for a moment, shall we, to uh, what happened to this missionary, Dr. Hardy, and the way that God spoke with him and dealt with him. After arriving in Korea, Hardy dedicated much effort to providing medical treatments as well as spreading the gospel, but hardly bore fruitful results in the latter. He was greatly disappointed, particularly by the failure of his missionary works in the First Church of Kongwon Province, blaming the result on the residents. 
during the prayer meeting of missionaries, a mighty wave of confession and repentance moved his spirit. When the Holy Spirit came upon me, he first commanded me to confess my failure and its cause before my fellow missionaries, with whom I spent most of the days during my missionary life. That was deeply painful and humiliating. At his repentance, other missionaries there started to confess their sins as well. Not only them, but also church members repented every bit of their sins. The unimaginable continued to occur. At one San Methodist church, Hardy confessed in tears before the congregation. I had a strong racial prejudice against Korean people. I was not filled with the Holy Spirit. At his confession, the congregation also asked him for forgiving their hatred for him. His true repentance as a leader awakened believers from a deep spiritual slumber. It was not until this time that Korean believers realized their sin and understood the true meaning of revival before God. We sometimes think that in revival times it's going to be the sinner who's going to have to repent before God, and that's right. But often in revival, it's when we, who are the believers, repent that God can cause the breakthrough. In fact, I asked you in a previous program to define what a real revival was, and you used that word repent, didn't you? You said it was key. Well, repentance is key. You know, without repentance, how can it be revival? And you think about Mr. Hardy, or Reverend Hardy, as a leader, he had to set the example. And he set the example by confessing his sins. And it's very biblical, confess your sins one to another. And he confessed the sin of racism, his hatred towards the Koreans. And he publicly confessed that sin, because that sin, as a leader, was publicly in his heart. But that must have been so, so hard to do. I mean, there he was, he'd gone as a missionary. He'd been sent out by his home church to evangelize the Koreans. And actually, he was saying was, I don't really like you. Well, it's quite incredible. But as the Bible says, you know, if you humble yourself under the Lord, then he will lift you up. And this man publicly humbled himself. And that is such a difficult thing to do. He didn't do it at home, in his own room. He did it publicly in front of all these people who looked up to him. Yeah. But because he did, you had the great Wonsan revival movement, which, you know, approximately about, there are about 30,000 people came to know the Lord. Which and we need to remember, of course, that this was a church which literally was very small in number because it was only just beginning about 40 years before. That's right. It was only a, a small little place, but God really rent the heavens and he poured out his spirit upon him. And of course, with the leader confessing his sins and being revived, and then the people themselves, the congregation, they could look in their own hearts and as the Holy Spirit searched them, and they themselves could confess their sins one to another and confess their sins to the Lord. I mean, the Bible speaks about confessing and forsaking our sins. And I think that's very important that we have to forsake those sins. We think about the word repentance, uh, the Greek word metanoia, like 180 degrees, complete turnaround, a complete change of way of doing things. But I remember looking up in the Bible, the word revival, and of course, the word revival isn't there in the Bible, but what is in the Bible is the word revive. But if something is going to be revived, it means it has to have existed before uh, and, and then sort of die and then come back to life. And I thought, well, how therefore can we possibly talk about a revival in Korea? Because it was a new church, so there wasn't a church that had died and come to life. And then I began to see, actually, it was the missionaries who years before had made com com uh, confessions of faith in Christ and were excited for their faith and, and something had died and God had to restore and as they came to life so the revival began to break out in Korea. Yeah like you said they were revived they were quickened they were brought to life I mean Jesus said, said himself I've come to give you life and to give it to you to the full and you know with the Holy Spirit in them they had life to the full and, and as the Holy Spirit came down it kind of outflowed and touched people. Right. So that was 1904 and revival came. 
what? 1906 was a conference. A gentleman, I don't know who he was, but a, a Dr. Johnson, a Mr. Johnson, was speaking at it. He began to talk. We need to forget, but remember, there was no uh, telephones and mass communication and TV screens. So 1906, he was telling them about the Welsh revival of 1904 and the way that it had spread to India and the Cassie Hills and revival had broken out there. And he was saying, look, what God did in 1904, what God did in 1906, he could be doing in your midst too. And it excited them, didn't it? That's right. Dr. Agnew Johnson from New York, America, he went there and he said, look, this is what's happened in other places. And we have to remember that the Welsh revival of 1904, 1905 under Evan Roberts is very instrumental to birthing and encouraging many other revivals across the land. Um, they were stimulated by faith. They saw what God could do, how God could change a nation in Wales. And they thought, well, why not in Korea? And so, like I said, Dr. Johnson went there and he spoke to the missionaries and he wanted to encourage them and say, look, you know, we need to see God rend the heavens and pour out a spirit. And he imparted some sort of spiritual fire to them. Um, they were very zealous for the Lord and they carried on. So they went, if I understand right, those missionaries who were at that particular conference went back to, to their community in Pyongyang or wherever it was that they were, and they began to pray. And I think they began to pray every day. But prayer is so important. Prayer and intercession is, is vital work and it's vital uh, ministry. But they were praying for God. They were pleading for God that God would really pour out a spirit and touch them. I mean, because in many respects it could be said more happens in like one year revival than 50 years without one. Mm. And, you know, when the revival actually did come, the missionary work was just quite frankly phenomenal. And looking back what the missionary said, yes, it actually paid dividends um, to, have, to have prayed for so long because God did more in a short space of time than what we had done in many years being there brings to mind the story of Martha and Mary. Martha was complaining, wasn't she, because she was busy in the kitchen and, and Mary just wanted to be at the feet of Jesus. It's getting that right balance, isn't it, between doing things and just spending time in the presence of the Lord. And that's one of the lessons the missionaries had to learn. But wow, when we come to that conference that you spoke on a little earlier on, breakthrough came and it came through in a mighty way. I mean, Koreans, um, if I understand right, are not people who find public confession, um, talking about themselves in public, something that comes easy to them. And so to have had a breakthrough where they were confessing publicly must have been major for them. Yes, I mean, you know, we talk about the British having a stiff upper lip and the Koreans themselves were very reserved, didn't show much emotion. Um, for them to show emotion would be to, in the Oriental language, would be to lose face. So to stand up and to publicly confess your sin publicly in front of people who are younger than you, obviously many would be older than you, but especially younger than you, so difficult for them. Um, but they come under conviction of sin. And as the Bible says, you know, confess your sins one to another. And they did that. They publicly confessed their sins. I mean, not all sins have to be um, publicly confessed, but God really touched them. There was one man, an elder, Mr. Keel, and he had misappropriated one hundred dollars and he publicly confessed that sin theft and he did restitution so he gave that money back to her i mean this was an elder in the church but this elder keel he went on to be very very instrumental in that revival because he publicly confessed that sin repentance with tears did not end there the people who repented atoned for their sins stolen money and goods were returned to owners those who hurt others visited the broken-hearted and begged their pardon. Things perverted and distorted were corrected in God's grace. In the early 20th century, Pyongyang was a city of wine, women and song. It was a dark city where lies and obscene acts were committed every day. However, from this fallen city, the revival of Korea started chose the land of decadence and lies and he changed it into a Jerusalem a city of grace and blessing it was also during this particular time that a characteristic of the the church in Korea uh, took place which was praying all together 
because I think it was during the revival that, that people were queuing up in order to pray because that was one of the customs in the Korean church that one after the next would pray. It just wasn't time to get everyone in. And, and so a dozen would start off and one there, one there, one there, and they'd all begin to pray. And in the end, the leader of the, the, the meeting said, well, if that's the way you want to do it, then let's all pray together. And that's become a characteristic, I understand, of the church in Korea. That's right. Prayer in unison. And it began in the Pyongyang Great Revival. All these different people praying at once. And it was like a great sea, a great wall of prayer going up to heaven. And, you know, they still do that today. You started off by talking about the uh, persecution from the Japanese, particularly, uh, who came in 1910 and were there all the way through till 1945. And it was because the church was birthed in persecution that the people understood the importance of taking the scriptures and learning the scriptures and reading them. And, and it became fundamental for the new Christians to read and to learn the scriptures. That's right. The word of God was so important. And like you said, you know, they didn't get the New Testament until well, it was published in 1911. So they had this revival and they only had the New Testament in print. Um, what is great that the Koreans, they really devoured the word of God, you know, to have the Bible. I, I think if we were sort of not permitted the Bible and we weren't allowed to read it and our Bible was confiscated and taken off from us, like it happens to be the Christians in North Korea, I mean, for many of us, it will be a tragedy, you know, not being able to, to read the Word of God. I mean, some people can retain large amounts of information, um, other people can't. I mean, but the Word of God is incredible. It, you know, gives such encouragement, stimulation, etc. And like I said, well, it is the Word of God. It's God's Word to mankind. That's right. That's right. There was a missionary who went into one particular community and he was going to baptise a lot of the people who were there. And he said, he thought to himself, well, before baptism, I'd better make sure that they're reading the Bible. And so he said to the first one, well, do you know some scripture? And she began to, to reel off verse after verse after verse. After she'd done a hundred verses, he stopped her. And uh, he, he, he began to talk to the others. He found equally. And he thought, we'll never get the baptisms done if we ask all of them to tell us verses that they know. But because they so feared that they would lose the Bible, it became so real to them. Yes. I mean, what's also interesting that many of these converts, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't baptise them until after a year until you know, they, they made their confession of faith because they wanted to genuinely make sure these people were well and truly converted. And like you said, there was a number of uh, mass baptisms because so many people wanted it, you know, and there was the, the catechism. So they had been taught to the doctrines of the Christian faith and, and everything. And it's, you know, just wonderful. 1945, of course, Korea divided into two, the North and the South. It, it's said that in South Korea, revival still goes on today. I think 10 of the 12 largest churches in the world of uh, prayer meetings uh, with thousands attending are still going on, particularly praying for the Christians in the North. How should we pray? Well, I think that we should pray for the persecuted brethren, the Bible. Bible tells us so. I mean, me personally, I pray for grace and strength that they would be helped in a time of persecution. I look back in the persecution that happened in China, and in much is still happening in China, and the books that I've read, and the people I've spoken to, and they've said, we don't actually want the persecution to go away. This is Chinese brethren, because it helps refine the church. It helps strengthen them. So I would pray that God would give them strength and help and grace in their time of need. Now, when I went to Bible college a few decades back, there was a number of Koreans there who studied. Mm -hmm. And you speak to them, how many people are in your congregation? 30,000 people. If you want to read more about the Korean revival, then you can do it in the book, Do It Again, Lord. And uh, what God has done once, he can do it again. Until the next time, God bless you, and thanks for being with us. <laughs>